Hey everybody, my name is Chris Rice, and I'm here today to tell you my vision for the future. I almost sounded like I was running for president there for a second, didn't I? <laughs> no, but for real though, I do want to tell you my vision for the future. But before we begin, I just want to set a couple of ground rules for this talk. Namely, I want to ask that if you have any questions, you just save them for the end. We'll have plenty of time for Q&A later. And this way, you won't interrupt the class. Secondly, this will be a relatively subversive presentation. So if you feel that this class isn't for you, feel free to leave at any time. You won't hurt my feelings, believe me. But again, if there is a point of contention or anything you want to fact check me on or debate, please feel free to approach me at the end and we can talk in depth then without me losing my train of thought or you disrupting the class for uh, the other people here who might be listening. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, my name is Chris Rice. Uh, I am a writer and documentary filmmaker primarily focused on ethnobotany and ethnopharmacology through a historical and theological lens. If you know me for anything at all, it is most likely my documentary Cannabis, A Lost History, or one of the other films in the A Lost History series. This is my third year speaking at Herbstock, and the last couple of times I focused primarily on entheogenic plant medicines. But I always felt like kind of a black sheep or, you know, kind of an outsider here at Herbstock, since usually it's more about like tinctures and teas and lavenders and oxymels and stinging nettle and whatnot. So this year I decided not to talk about psychedelic plants. And uh, what do you know? <laughs> the psychedelic renaissance must be in full swing because this year we have classes about cannabis and ayahuasca, um, both of which I hope you had a chance to attend. But I digress. Uh, today I'm here to talk to you about another subject that I believe is psychedelic in and of itself, and that is ecology. For those of you who are unfamiliar with what ecology is, uh, this is the eco in eco-friendly. It is the relationship between an organism and its environment, and uh, more specifically in our case, the relationship between humanity and nature. To me, this is one of the most psychedelic subjects of all. You see, psychedelics make you acutely aware of your connection with, uh, with nature, with the planet, with the universe. In fact, Albert Hoffman, the father of LSD, said that uh, through my LSD experience and my new picture of reality, I became aware of the wonder of creation, the magnificence of nature, and of the animal and plant kingdom. I became very sensitive to what will happen to all this and all of us. And he's not the only one. Aldous Huxley famously wrote of a psychedelic utopia espousing ecological values in his final novel, Island. Additionally, many agree that the uh, ecological movement in modern times was born out of the hippie counterculture of the 1960s, and I don't think I need to tell you that they were on psychedelics. Um, so as you can see, there is this long-standing connection between psychedelics and environmentalism, and this is no accident. If you've ever seen the brain scans of people that are under the influence of psychedelics, they're quite fascinating. Uh, Basically, during normal waking consciousness, your visual cortex, audio cortex, olfactory cortex, etc., all, all operate sort of independently from one another. Uh, this prevents synesthesia and, and things like that. It's kind of advantageous for navigating uh, the world as a hunter-gatherer. But in the psychedelic state, the floodgates of communication are open, and as a result, your brain is considerably more unified. This arguably could be responsible for the feeling of unity and oneness with the world that you experience in altered states of consciousness. Um, in shamanic cultures, they kind of, like the Shipibo, for instance, they kind of um, look at this and interpret it in kind of a different light. Uh, sort of as though the plants or fungus we have consumed are communicating with us, um, you know, through our uh, neurochemistry. Almost as if by telepathy, or, you know, something like that after ingestion. In any event, uh, you realize when you're in the psychedelic state that we can't continue on our current trajectory of production for the sake of production, the infinite growth paradigm, the degradation of our atmosphere, the pollution of our environment, because we're very much a part of this planet, and it is alive. So given that information, 
that you are a part of the universal oneness of this planet, you start to take that stewardship role that, by the way, is also described in the Bible very seriously. Now, I can see some of your eyes beginning to roll, uh, and I realize that statistically, given the size of the audience, someone here is bound to not believe in global warming. And to that person, I say, you know, you don't need to believe in climate change to acknowledge the very tangible ecological impact we're having on our planet. Just look at the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, as pictured here, or Fukushima, or the many places on our, on our planet that are now inhospitable due to nuclear catastrophe, both accidental and planned. Or the pollution in China, or India, or Mexico City, or even New York. Or the water in Flint, or the melting of the ice caps, or some of the world's numerous plastic beaches. Or the poisoning of the environment with neonicotinoid pesticides, which have led to the collapse of bee populations. Or the fact that plastics take an estimated thousand years or more to break down. Or the stripping of our Earth's uh, natural and finite resources for the production of gasoline, technical gadgetry, uh, in petroplastics. Or the reality that we're in the midst of the sixth great mass extinction, which scientists have deemed the Anthropocene extinction due to the overwhelming evidence that human activity is a primary factor to this species' devastation. In fact, they actually refer to humanity as an unprecedented global super predator, causing an estimated 30 to 50 percent of all species to die by the middle of the century. I mean, this type of extinction is usually reserved for, you know, like uh, asteroidal impacts and ice ages and things along those lines. So in some sick way, it's a testament to the abilities of mankind that we are able to have such an effect, such a lasting impact on our environment. And for the sake of context, picture here is a whale that had been cut open to show the contents of its stomach. But anyway, today's talk isn't about shaming climate change deniers, and I know you didn't pay to come here to uh, listen to me talk to, about the world's problems without bringing up any solutions, did you? Remember, I said I wanted to tell you about my vision for the future. Well, I'm going to borrow terminology from AA here for just a moment and say that the first step is admitting that you have a problem. And I feel I've done my best to illustrate that uh, this is the case through some of the examples I've mentioned thus far. One of our biggest hurdles is garbage and recycling. Now, I know that my audience at Herbstock is very intelligent, so I'm really not going to spend a lot of time on the basics and you know, bore you with the details. You all know what to do. It's just a matter of doing it. By that, I mean you know, uh, bringing reusable cups, reusable containers, bags, and cutlery with you, um, you know, when you go for a picnic or, or out to eat or something. Um, try to avoid waste whenever possible. Buy bulk foods, for instance, in order to reduce your plastic waste. This is all uh, very important because plastic takes upwards of a 1,000 years to break down, as I mentioned a moment ago. Buy compostable and biodegradable versions of single-use products whenever you can. Uh, it, it's all easy enough. What I came here today to talk about was more of the big picture stuff. Some, uh, you know, change the way the world operates kind of stuff. Or if this sounds a little less threatening, it's that leave your kids a hospitable planet stuff. The bioplastics are actually an excellent example of this. If you're unaware, plastics can be made from things like hemp, wheat, avocados, even lobster shells. So yes, you can buy biodegradable kitchenware and trash bags on Amazon. But what about when you go to the store and you... I don't know, buy a bottle of soda or a bag of chips or, or water or whatever from you know, just any regular convenience store. This is something I want to dive into in a bit more detail, but we'll get back to that a little bit later. But while we're on the subject of plastic waste, I want to talk briefly about bioremediation and microremediation. Basically, this is the utilization of biology to help dig ourselves out of the mess that we've uh, dug ourselves in to and have discussed up until this point. Um, this video will explain in greater detail. Okay, so similar to what we saw in the previous video, 
a mushroom species known as Pestilotiopsis microspora was recently discovered. This fungus is able to break down plastic waste because it uses it as a food source. It basically rearranges the hydrocarbons into hydrogen and carbon molecules, respectively, and miraculously through this process, it converts the plastic into organic matter. These mushrooms are actually edible, and the more plastic they are fed, the more mushrooms they will grow. We can literally work towards resolving the hunger crisis and the plastic pollution crisis using this same approach. People who consume these uh, plastic-eating mushrooms say they taste like licorice or anise. Since their discovery in 2012, scientists have found several other species of mushrooms capable of sub, uh, subsiding on petroplastics as well. So since we're starting to go down the rabbit hole of food production and food in relationship to our ecosystem, this talk would be incomplete if I didn't mention bees. As I said earlier, we're in the midst of a mass extinction. And if you're unaware, bees play an integral role in the survival of this planet. The estimation is that bees are responsible for every third bite of food that you take. And it's arguably higher in that the animals you eat rely on plants to survive as well. So just to be clear, this uh, not only affects every man, woman, and child on this planet, it affects animals too. It also affects any business that might be involved in food and food production. There are a variety of things that seem to be responsible for colony collapse disorder and for bee die-off in general. These things range from, you know, our various frequencies, Wi-Fi, 3G, 4G, LTE, 5G, um, interfering with their communication and navigation systems, uh, to use of neonicotinoid pesticides like Monsanto's Roundup, to a prevalent virus that is affecting bees known as deformed wing virus. I do not see humanity ceasing or slowing technological advancement anytime soon. But as far as the virus is concerned, the acclaimed mycologist Paul Stamets et al. have uh, developed a vaccine that shows great promise in treating deformed wing, causing a 79-fold reduction in the illness. As far as glyphosate, the world's most widely used herbicide and other similar neonicotinoid pesticides, the evidence is continuing to pile up that these are not just dangerous for bees for humans as well. I feel like this goes without saying, but we need to stop using chemicals that poison us and poison our planet in the name of profitability for a select handful of people. Now, I know some of you may be thinking, okay, well, then how do you suggest we feed all the people on this planet? I mean, part of what pesticides and herbicides do is ensure crop survival, and if crops die, we can't feed the whole planet, right? Well, again, this is a nuanced issue um, with a lot of gray area, but you are right that having plentiful crops is important. But you have to also realize that the primary reason people can't get food worldwide is due to a lack of funds, not a lack of food. According to the BBC, we already produce one and a half times the amount of food necessary to feed the entire planet every year. Grocery chains throw away 43 billion pounds of food every year. That's why the next thing I wanted to talk to you about is new modalities for feeding hungry people that don't necessarily require money. As you'll see, these tactics will not only benefit the people, but the planet as well. The primary idea here is to turn abandoned lots, lawns, medians, rooftops, and public land areas into gardens and food forests. Pictured here is Robert Hart, horticulturist and father of the food forest. Similar tactics, though, have been implemented and adopted by Ron Finley, known to many as the Gangsta Gardener. You may have seen his excellent TED Talk on this subject. This is especially useful in areas known as food deserts, urban areas in which fresh produce is virtually inaccessible. Gorilla gardening is simple. I mean, you know, you can grow anything you're able to grow in a regular garden. Food forests, on the other hand, are a bit more strategic. This illustration depicts the different layers of food forests as derived by the old British gentleman on the previous page. This, much like our existing forests, consists of multiple complementary layers. 
Now, to me, the idea that this can be done with relative ease in abandoned lots across America is exemplary of what mankind can achieve if we work together and put our minds to it. And this is but a small sample of the many principles of permaculture. There is so much we can do as a society if we take collective action, but we'll dive more into that later. So since we're on the topic of food, I also wanted to talk to you briefly about hydroponics and aquaponics systems. Now, this is based on ancient Aztec farming techniques from around the 11th century AD. It allows for the growth of vegetables without the use of fertilizer, pesticides, etc. The way it works is really fa uh, fascinating. This graphic on the next page um, kind of gives a better explanation than the one here. Um, so basically, fish produce waste which contains ammonia. Microorganisms convert the ammonia into nitrites and then to nitrates for plants. Plants that absorb the nitrates and give aerated water back to the fish, then you simply feed the fish. They produce more waste, which contains ammonia, and the cycle continues. Um, also, I just wanted to mention a quick anecdote. You're probably all familiar with Elon Musk. Uh, his brother, Kimball, is also a super genius, but um, is working on you know different things. What he is working on uh, and what he has developed is a... Uh, basically like a storage, like a shipping container um, that has vertical aquaponic um, farming systems. So basically he's able to produce a significant amount more, you know, vegetables in a given area than would be possible with a traditional farm. And it's 100% climate controlled and so forth. The only drawback here is uh, it does have a relatively high, high cost of electricity, but... Um, you know, I'm sure with solar panels and wind power and so forth, in time, that will go down dramatically and it will actually reduce uh, food costs overall. While we're still on the topic of food, I definitely couldn't go this entire time without talking about vegetarianism and more specifically veganism. Um, according to this slide here, uh, each day a vegan diet saves one animal's life 100 gallons of water, 45 pounds of grain, 20 pounds uh, of CO2, and about 30 square feet of forested land. Um, so basically, the, the reason that this is the case is because, you know, a lot of people say, oh, if you eat plants, you'll actually be doing more harm to the environment in that, you know, plants take up space, they take up a lot more space than an animal and so forth. But you have to realize when you're eating animals, those animals eat plants uh, as well. You know, uh, cows eat corn, cows eat grain, cows eat soybeans. So all of that would um, take up a lot of land, a lot of which, by the way, is in the Amazonian rainforest. I do want to mention, too, that if you feel your health, for some reason, wouldn't, sus wouldn't be able to sustain a vegetarian diet or a vegan diet, and I know some people do feel that way, um, even though, for instance, red meat causes colon cancer, Alzheimer's, and heart disease. But if you do feel that way, um, even if you were to eliminate some of the meat from your diet, uh, what some people call flexitarian, that is to say, you know, instead of eating meat seven days a week, eat meat five days a week, or instead of eating meat three meals a day, eat meat one meal a day, or, or two meals a day. Um, even if you were to make those concessions, you would be doing a great deal uh, more than you are now to help the planet. And additionally, uh, you may be unaware of this. It is relatively uh, recent, but vegan food has come a long way. I mean, now you can get you can get like a vegan burger that's indistinguishable from a beef-based burger. You can get vegan sausages that are indistinguishable from you know uh, pork-based sausages. There's vegan cheeses that are relatively comparable to regular cheese and so on and so forth. So uh, the only thing you would really be missing is, you know, going back to Outback Steakhouse or, or something like that. But in terms of the food that you're able to eat, you're, you're able to eat virtually the same quality of food uh, as you could without a vegan diet. 
Next, I want to briefly discuss new modalities of home building. As you're probably aware, environmental issues are becoming more important in the design, construction, and use of buildings than they've ever been before. The first thing I want to talk about might be a little bit less practical in our climate, but it's just too, too interesting a subject to skip over. And this is an Earthship. While it does use some traditional building materials, there are less common materials involved, such as old tires, cans, and bottles in most earth, Earthships as well. This is not only an excellent way to recycle these products, it is also structurally useful. Because of the materials used, these houses are relatively inexpensive to make. People are building them for between ten dollars and $100,000, and the higher cost ones are super extravagant. And as I said a moment ago, some of this isn't entirely practical or necessary in New England, but we can learn a few things from the design and implementation uh, here as well. For instance, the cistern to collect rainwater may be important in the deserts of New Mexico, where earthships originate, but here, a simple well would do just fine. In spite of that, the rest of the way this works is actually very cool. So um, basically, uh, it's kind of like a self-contained ecosystem in a sense. Not entirely. Obviously, you do have to go to the store and buy some things or whatever, but like, so the solar panel, uh, wind generator, produce electricity that goes into a battery from there it is converted from uh, direct current to alternating currents um, <clears throat> you know for use of your appliances and whatnot uh, the water is filtered from the cistern goes into a clean water tank which provides you know filtered water uh, for drinking as well as you know say washing your hands using the restroom etc uh, taking a shower and so forth uh, you know, I did mention the old tires on the previous page. These rammed earth tires uh, are not only structurally relevant, they also provide like a uh, thermal insulation as well. So then after that, uh, you know, as I was saying earlier, um, it is kind of like a self-sustained ecosystem. So you use the sink that goes into, you know, the water from your hands goes into a gray water tank that is then filtered and provides... Um, nutrients for fruits and vegetables uh, in this botanical cell, which is behind a, um, you know, glass panel. It's almost like, kind of like a greenhouse built into your house. Um, when you use the toilet, um, that is filtered as well. It goes into a, another chamber, uh, which is a solar septic tank. The solar energy, um, you know, does break down the matter in there, uh, for lack of a grosser term. Uh, and then from there, it goes to the non-edible plants, which are outside of your house. Um, you know, plants, of course, um, produce oxygen and suck in CO2. So it's all around useful, um, you know, for everyone. Another building material that's definitely worth mentioning is hempcrete and even hemp wood. Let's, click, uh, let's quickly watch this video that shows how amazing this building material truly is. So as you can see, it was virtually impossible for that acetylene torch um, to burn through the hempcrete. So it is very flame resistant. Uh, it's an excellent insulator as well. Um, hemp takes about two months to grow on average. Trees take you know decades, hundreds of years um, to grow to a place where they're able to produce the wood for homes. Um, so you can build the material much more quickly, uh, which in theory would be more cost effective if our government would loosen restrictions on growing hemp. Um, anyway, as far as the carbon negative thing, by the way, hemp is able to absorb CO2 at about 165 kilograms per meter cubed. Um, so essentially by using hemp as a building material, you are not only um, carbon neutral, but carbon negative in your ecological impact. So outside of the you know housing and structural stuff, uh, I want to talk to you about a subject that some people veer, feel very strongly about, and that's having children. Now, obviously, I don't think there should be a government mandate telling you to only have one child, um, as was implemented in China several decades ago. 
whenever I mention that people should have only one kid, um, that is always their logical conclusion. Oh, what? You think the government should tell us what to do? No, I don't. I don't think that. But I do think that you should be cognizant of, um, you know, your carbon footprint, your ecological footprint on the planet. Um, obviously, our planet at present is too full of people. So for you to say, you know, each person should have a person replace them, you know, for instance, two parents have two children. That's, the planet's not going to be able to sustain it in the long term. Especially, you know, those people who have 19, 20 kids, etc. Now, obviously, that's less common in America. It's interesting enough, in fact, that we put it on television, but in other countries, that is kind of the norm. Uh, so I also want to mention the role of women's education, uh, how that plays into all of this. Some of you may be aware, some of you may not, but the more educated women are on average, the lower the likelihood of them having a bunch of children. It's That's not me, that's sociologists. There's been long-term scientific studies on this. So basically, as women become more educated, go into the workforce, you know, uh, go to college, become doctors, they're spending a lot more time outside of the home, a lot less time in the home, so less time to rear children, and then therefore, you know, less children end up happening in environments where uh, women have a higher education. So I do think that that's going to play a large role in, um, you know, us making a sustainable and tenable um, population size in the future. And as I promised earlier, I do also want to go back into this for a moment. Uh, like I had said earlier, you can buy compostable and biodegradable plastics for your own personal use, but this is extremely inaccessible when buying prepared foods and drinks or going to your ordinary uh, convenience store. This is due almost entirely to both corporate and government inaction. As this slide from The Independent, which is a you know prominent UK publication, as this slide says, Almost every country in the world agrees to cut plastic pollution, except U.S. Countries have decided to do something which will translate into real action, says the U.N. leader. 168 countries reached an agreement on Friday. This is, you know, a couple weeks ago now, but um, basically they're going to track plastic waste. Um, the U.S. does not agree to do this. But, you know, this is definitely a worldwide problem. Our excesses in the West are produced in the East, leading to m massive pollution in places like India and China. Their own growing populations in comparison to landmass make things worse, for sure. But as we see every Black Friday, the keeping up with the Joneses of late-stage capitalism leads to overconsumption. It's not entirely our fault either, as we'll discuss a bit more. But we should be aware of our purchasing behavior. Like, do you really need the latest new iPhone every year? Do you need this season's hilariously bad as seen on TV product? Do you need to jump from 1080 to 4K TV just because? You know, I don't mean to shame society too greatly, but we just have to be cognizant of purchasing and why we are purchasing. You know, recently I went to uh, Phoenix, Arizona, for instance. First time I was ever there. And uh, I expected kind of like these, you know, the image of Phoenix is wide open desert is spaces with like Spanish colonial buildings and some cactuses and whatnot. But that's not what it was at all. <laughs> it was basically just paved, cold, capitalist construction. It was parking lot after parking lot after parking lot after Target after Starbucks Sprint store, Verizon store, AT&T store, Target, Target, Starbucks, Target, Starbucks, Target, Starbucks. Now, instead of falling into the marketing campaigns that the corporations have pulled over our eyes in the name of infinite growth, we need to be aware. Because as much as new housing materials, solar panels, reusable bags, and compostable forks are useful and responsible uh, decisions to make in our quest to save the planet. There's no comparison between our individual lifestyle choices and the government and corporate inaction on climate change. 
In fact, just 100 companies are responsible for 71% of global emissions. It goes back to the fossil fuels, the petroplastics. We're at, a, we're, at a, we're at a place where we are technologically and economically capable of moving past this. Electric cars, bioplastics, algae-based fuels, hydrogen fuel cells. All these things already exist. Meanwhile, U.S. fossil fuel subsidies exceed even Pentagon spending. And on that note, our military spending is larger than the next 10 nations combined. Yet, we can't afford to spend essentially anything, even a fraction of our military expenditure, on, pre pre on preventing ecological devastation. Which reminds me of one of my favorite Gandhi quotes. The earth provides enough to satisfy every man's needs, but not every man's greed. So let me ask the question. Are we really going to let a bunch of greedy, selfish fools do in the whole planet? In the words of the late, great Terence McKenna, what civilization is, is six billion people trying to make themselves happy by standing on each other's shoulders and kicking each other's teeth in. It's not a pleasant situation, and yet you can stand back and look at this planet and see that we have the money, the power, the medical understanding, the scientific know-how, the love, and the community to produce a kind of human paradise. But we are led by the least among us, the least intelligent, the least noble, the least visionary. We are led by the least among us, and we do not fight back against the dehumanizing values that are handed down as control icons. So I started off today by saying I wanted to tell you my vision for the future. And everything that I've mentioned up until this point is a start. We need to use our autonomy to make better decisions personally, sure. But we also need to use it to influence the governments, the corporations, to take action. The paradigm is beginning to shift. The veil is beginning to lift. <laughs> Dr. Seuss or something. Um, but it's not moving quickly enough. We have vegan burgers now at Burger King. Solar and wind energy becoming more widely adopted. And... Just the other day, I heard a plan by haagen and Hellman's, of all people, to return to a reusable container model to help eliminate waste, almost like, you know, the milkman or something. People are becoming more personally aware. And, you know, also, for instance, Costa Rica aims to be carbon neutral and plastic free in the next couple of years. I mean, some places are even so woke they're using paper straws. Uh, terrible joke, I know. <sighs> but in all seriousness, if we put our mind to it, we could build a relative utopia. Sure, statistically, based on population size, a true utopia probably isn't possible, yada, yada, yada. But we are entering a phase in which automation makes things so simple and resources are so widely available, we can develop what many call a post-scarcity economy, which, for me, is close enough. Pictured here is a city concept by the Venus Project, the brainchild of the late Jacques Fresco. It's the idea of a self-sustained city. As you can see, it's a circular city. The circular layout brings everyone closer to the hub of the center. Medical, food, shopping, etc. As a self-sustained city, wow, self-sustained city, try saying that three times fast, the items you buy, and this is my idea, by the way, not frescoes, would likely be 3D printed using bioplastics when feasible. The hemp, wheat, and avocados for these plastics could be grown in some of the numerous gardens and greenhouses throughout the city. And Fresco goes into a great deal more detail in his many books and documentaries, and obviously, this type of city would have to be intentionally designed, unlike the lovely and not at all confusing street layout we have here in Boston. But as climate change forces more and more people into less and less usable land, with the oceans rising all around us, there will be new and intentional cities, whether we like it or not.
But my personal dream for the future doesn't entirely abandon technology. I know earlier I made some remarks about lithium extraction in order to power our devices, and this is a very real issue. But at the same time, I believe once we reach a tipping point in artificial reality, if we were to develop rugged, durable VR headsets, there would be less of a need for tangible material possessions as we'd be living more and more of our lives in virtual reality. For better or worse, this seems to be the direction that the world is taking. I mean, half of you are itching to touch your phones right now. So if we continue on this trajectory, in the future, more and more, we will dematerialize. With artificial intelligence doing most of the menial labor, we'll have the time to explore virtual realms, to exalt in the beauty of Earth's forests, mountains, and beaches. And to tie this back, in the psych uh, tie this back into psychedelics, I think they will help a lot with all of this. I've talked about some of the amazing characteristics of non-psychoactive mushroom species up until now in this talk. But psilocybe mushrooms and their decriminalization would undoubtedly help people to see the bigger picture. This year, this has actually happened in Denver with ballot initiatives to decriminalize all psychedelics taking place in Oakland as well and more down the pipeline for 2020. We need to realize that we are more than our professions more than our possessions, more than our wallets, because we can't take all of that with us, which is a lesson so many people have yet to learn, and it's something you learn in altered states of consciousness. Along with another thing the mushrooms feel that is so important to teach us, and that is that we need to take care of our planet as ourselves. Because at the rate we're going, history ends with a mushroom, in one way or another. And it's up to us to decide exactly what that means. Thank you.